Everybody hear me okay? I have a loud, booming voice. My uh, mother was deaf, so as a small child, I kept saying, Mom, Mom, and she did, you know, came over and saw stuff. Anyway, um, thank you all for very, uh, coming and, and uh, listening to our pitch here on Cyber Range of Service. How many people know what a cyber range is? I always like to ask that question. Everybody raise your hand, right, or you're in the wrong place. Um, so we've been dealing with uh, helping companies figure out their infrastructure, their workflow from a prospect of looking at it from cyber, from a DevOps perspective, from a DevSecOps perspective, from a testing perspective. And we come at it from the infrastructure automation and workflow world. And I think everybody knows a little bit about infrastructure and automation. Everybody's into automation. How many people automate things? Anybody automate stuff here a little bit? Right? How many people are Python automators? Everybody. All right, good, good. Some of you. I gotta shake it a little bit. Okay, all right, right. So we talk about cyber range of service. It's crass. Right? Uh, as my wife said, why did you name it that? What, what is wrong with you? So anyway, uh, but it's basically creating lab and infrastructure as a surface to implement these different cyber range activities, right? So there's a lot of different cyber range activities. We're going to talk about what is a cyber range, the challenges of delivering a cyber range. We'll talk about this idea and concept of a service delivering a cyber range, how to deliver it and what the value might be for that. We do have a, a, a booth here as well, a kiosk, if you want to come by and learn more. There's lots of stuff online, lots of white papers and information technology use cases, ROIs, and all kinds of stuff along these lines. So what is a cyber range? A cyber range is basically a copy of your production environment that you want to experiment on, train on, try things out, test, validate, and do whatever else, right? So we're replicating some sort of IT infrastructure, right? The applications, the test equipment, the test and security tools, the attack scripts, and we want to replicate this. And we don't want to do it as a simulated environment, although there are lots of companies that do it as a simulated, but there's a big discrepancy between a simulated environment and your environment. I'll never forget the conversation I had with uh, one of the Maryland, uh, state of Maryland cabinet board members that was a cyber guy, he was a colonel from the army, and he said, you know, every single university and community college in the state of Maryland has a two-year cyber program. Any of you been to some of those? Maybe, maybe a couple of people graduated from that, who knows, right? And he said, I would never let any of those graduates touch my production Cisco or Juniper stack. Now, why is that? Well, because they trained on open source tools. They trained on simulated environments. They trained on uh, copies of things that were not real production. There is a big difference between a Cisco stack and using PFSense and, and on firewalls and things of that nature, right? So we need to have replicated exact copies of production in a cyber range to really sniff out and understand all the problems. Now, a cyber range also has a lot of stakeholders, right? First of all, how expensive is a cyber range? Very, right? If it's an actual copy of our Cisco stack, Cisco doesn't give us stacks for free. They charge us for another copy, right? And it needs to be exactly like production, so I've got all the support and nightmare. So, so we have a lot of stakeholders. We have the training IT people. We have the people managing the test configurations. We have the people doing the red teams and the blue teams and simulating attacks. We have DevOps people that are generating apps in the cyber world or building new apps and have to check those. We have all the proof of concepts. You know, Cisco comes out with a new version of software, firmware, new device, whatever. We got to bring it in, try it out, make sure it's cyber proof, right? Uh, do what uh, DISA does. Uh, anybody know what DISA is? That's the uh, IT department for the Department of Defense. Uh, they're constantly attacked. They're constantly rolling out new revs and they constantly have to validate and test and make sure there's no holes in things before they deploy. Uh, application compliance assessment for security reporting, all those different kinds of things, right? So, <clears throat> so let's talk about those stakeholders and those individual tasks of those stakeholders, right? So we'll talk about the people, the process, and the technology. So first we've got cyber range admins. You ever gone out and looked for cyber range admin on Indeed or one of the job sites? You find anybody out there? Let me know if you find them because I want to hire them. They don't exist. There are not very many of them, right? They're very expensive. Oh yeah, they cost a lot of money or they're you know, a Deloitte consultant or Accenture consultant or whatever, right? Uh, they're not 
or, or they're homegrown. So they're very expensive people. They have to manage the virtual and physical resources. They have to manage the IT. They do all the conflict stuff. They have to write the automation scripts. They are very important stakeholders to our success of using a cyber range. Then we have people that are content developers. You know, what are we doing inside our cyber range? Are we training people? Are we running exercises? Are we sharing topologies? Are we building reusable content, whether it's training content, whether it's uh, you know, exercise content, or maybe we're doing application and service performance. Uh, maybe we're supporting an LMS, a learning management system in, inside of this environment. So there's all those developers, or what I call consumers of, uh, of the aspects of the cyber range. And then we have those guys that manage. Do we have any management here? Nobody's going to raise their hand, are they? <laughs> all right, well, management cares about what? Cost. That's all they care about. They don't care about risk. Eh, maybe they care a little bit about risk. But they care about cost. How expensive is the cyber range? Are we getting our performance out of the cyber range? Why are we spending all this money on this darn cyber range? Because it hasn't done anything for us. Well, maybe it has done something for us. Or if you're using Mandiant tools, you can see in a lot of cases where it does do things for you. Right? So what's the cycle time? How, how quick can we do another one? Uh, do we have analysis back from our end users? Are they getting anything out of this? Right? How much does it cost again? Right? And then lastly, we have the actual end users that might consume and use something in a cyber range, right? How easy is it for them to do it? How quickly can they do it? How real world is it? Are there lots of catalogs of cyber ranges? How do we integrate our particular user environment into uh, so that it makes sense, right? Because everybody has different tools. Everybody has different cyber tools. They have different uh, infrastructure. There's all sorts of things. So you have to make it easy for them to use that. Anything I miss? Okay, moving on. So there's a lot of challenges. I'm not going to read all these. I'm just going to flip through them. But supporting all the different use cases, the lifecycle management of cyber range, right? Keeping it up to date, metrics on it, all the different fragmented access and users. You know, where is it? How is it? How do I get to it? What's the controls? What's the compliance? What's the governance? All those things, right? How reusable is it? How automated is it? How complex is it? So basically, we have developed a uh, cyber range as a service workflow on how do you go about the process of implementing a cyber range. And you can do this with some COTS tools, or you can do it on your own. Uh, it's obviously easier to do it with some COTS tools, but you know, there, there's a process, right? Um, and I'm, I'm not going to actually say what this process is, but I'm going to walk you through each one of the slides on it. But it is a stepped process to build out a cyber range. So the first thing you need to do is you need to manage and build your cyber inventory. What is your environment? Are you all in the cloud? Are we all in Google Cloud and the whole entire DevOps team's in Google Cloud? All our VMs are in Google Cloud? Well, we'll stay in Google Cloud. But what if we're a physical device place, right? And we've got physical hardware. We've got routers and switches and firewalls and encryptors and all kinds of other stuff. Well, we've got to manage those things, right? So we've got to bring those things in. So you have to basically populate your inventory before you can build a cyber range so we can use some very interesting things. So how many people know about OASIS standards? Anybody? A couple? All right. Tosca modeling, the topology orchestration web automation modeling standard. You can use that to do auto loads and basically read in Cisco devices and Juniper devices and Palo Alto and other firewalls and devices and read that information in of whatever's in your lab. We call that an auto load process, right? So we bring those things in. If you look on the list, I don't know if you can see, but you know, there's things like Aris cable modems and Juniper routers and Cisco stuff and firmware and Jenkins and Travis and JFrog and uh, layer one switches and whatever's in your lab, right? The idea is to capture everything, all the resources that you have that you need to deploy your cyber range on top of, okay? So you build that in, you inventory that, and you populate it with automation models for those things. Basically YAML, Shell, TOS, Tosca modeling standards. Once you have those things, uh, did I go to? Okay, that's one and two, yep. Uh, once you have those things, you can drop and drag those onto a blueprint. And a blueprint you can think of as a live Visio diagram. Wouldn't it be great if the Visio diagrams you made, the connections were real and the things were real, and you could click on those things and do operations on those things? Wouldn't that be great? Well, you can, there are some tools out there that will allow you to do that. So you drag and drop these things, right? You build them up, you build the physical, the virtual, 
And these are basically model-ready automation environments, right? So at the top here, you can see there's a whole bunch of VMs. They might be in VMware. The things in the middle might be in Iraq and Santa Clara. The things at the bottom might be in Google Cloud or AWS or Azure, right? So you have a, an environment, a topology of whatever your cyber range might be, okay? Here's another example, different ones. So once you have built some blueprints, you build a catalog of blueprints, right? Because we might have different things that we have to check out in cyber range. We might have a pre-production range, a production range. We might have different use cases within our organization of how we want to do that, right? So we want to build a catalog of these different blueprints for different users, depending on if they're developers or content developers or just consumers of the environment, so they can go through and do that. All right, so we standardize on those things and the tools that we want to use, how we use them, the attributes and parameters that people need to put into them, and make it basically a self-service environment. Uh, there's an example of this. How many people have been to Cisco? How many people know about Cisco? Come on, raise your hands. Everybody knows about Cisco, right? So Cisco has a thing called DevNet. Um, it's a tool that basically allows you to pull up a development lab, not necessarily a cyber range, but in, in theory, it's a test lab. It could be cyber, and they do have some cyber uh, event uh, things in there. But you can basically bring that up and consume an infrastructure and a workflow around some particular use case. So that's an example of um, a large installation, if you will. Uh, they actually have uh, a lot of users, 700,000. So you want something also that scales. Not everybody needs to scale to that. Um, I encourage you to go to that site, delver.cisco.com. It is, in fact, free. Uh, I don't work for Cisco, but it's a really cool place to go check out what is the art of possible, right, for setting up labs. So now I have, I pick a particular sandbox, right, uh, in this catalog of blueprints, and I want to consume that and reserve that. So I reserve it. There might be resources in there that are physical or shareable, right? So if I pick next Thursday at 2 o'clock, I want to use this particular sandbox, and somebody else already has some of the devices in there reserved for next Thursday at 2 o'clock, it's going to say, sorry, somebody else is using that. So it's very important in your cyber range to manage the scheduling and the reserving of things so that people don't step on people, right? So that's a big thing, so being able to reserve that. So now at the top, I've got some things. I've got a web server, an email exchange server, a file server, a database server. They happen to be in VMware, and I may want to configure those applications. I also happen to have a breaking point traffic simulator, which is a malware traffic simulator. It does all sorts of malware strikes. I've got a Snort IDS server. I've got a malware cuckoo uh, uh, analyzer as well. Right? And those all happen to be in vCenter, let's say, as an example. And then I've got some red team guys down here on the left and some blue team guys down on the right. And I might deploy those in Amazon or Google Cloud, right? They might just be VMs that I spin up somewhere else. I don't have to spin them up in my vCenter or they don't have to be actual physical PCs. They can be virtualized wherever you want them to be. Um, I might want to VLAN these things together and provision a network connectivity so that I set up these things appropriately, right? Um, I might also go up to the breaking point and click on it and say, start an attack. So attack that ASA firewall, right? Send some strikes to it. Let's see if it catches it, right? So then I might go over to the firewall, double click on it, pop into its GUI, update a policy, block that attack, right? Whatever might be happening. And then last but not least, it's very important that everybody be able to get access to all the devices in your blueprint. How many people know about something called guacamole? Not the green stuff. The open source project? Anybody? No? Yes? A couple? Of, all right, good. So if you have an encrypted version of Guacamole, you can basically get access to all of these devices. So your VNC, your RDP, your secure shell, telnet, web interfaces to all these devices. So now you have a single pane of glass where you can get to everything you do in your job as a cyber engineer, cyber exercise, cyber content. Last but not least, and probably most important, if you can capture everything in your cyber range, the who, the what, the when, the where, the how, because you handle all the infrastructure that's in the cyber range, you handle all the content that's in the cyber range, you handle all the actions that are in there, as well as all the users, domains, resources, et cetera, you should be able to take all that data 
and pump it out to some dashboards, right? So it's very important to build business intelligence and analytics on all that information, all right? Because what's that important thing the uh, manager was talking about? Cost, right? So now I can see how productive is my cyber range? Is it doing what we need to do? Who's using the cyber range? What are the bottlenecks in the cyber range? Is everybody using the breaking point traffic simulator? And uh, somebody comes to me and says, hey, I need another breaking point simulator. And you go out and you look in the analytics and it says, you're really only using that one 30% of the time. Go back, to, go back to using that one a little more, more efficiently. Or if it says, hey, it's 95% utilized, so I say, well, probably need another one then, right? Because we're, we're stepping and getting out of, out of the measurement of those resources. So utilization, uh, usage, all the attributes, pumping these things into dashboards so you can make good, accurate decisions about the lifecycle management of your cyber range. So this cyber range of service is kind of a modeling and deploying production-like IT cyber environments. You have different applications, you have different data, we have different testing tools, services, virtual infrastructure, physical infrastructure, all combined in one set of an environment. Put an API on top of it and a self-service portal so we can control it and automate it and make it easy to use and consume for the people that are going to use it. And then target it to whatever cloud or infrastructure implementation you'd like to use, whether it's VMware, or OpenStack, or Kubernetes, Amazon, Google, or even bare metal. So why do you do this stuff? Well, you go out, you increase your agility, responsive, repeatability, support the new technologies. Uh, I don't want to read all these, but there's a whole bunch of them. Automation, quicker, better, faster, cheaper, lessen the administrative burden implement these things appropriately. But basically, you, you've got a nice life cycle management. Select the environment, verify the availability, reserve it, set it up, conduct your activities, collaborate, tear it down, release the resources back in so someone else can use them. OK. Well, I had that slide twice. Why is that? Well. Hopefully, we'll get out of that slide. There we go. So if we look at the traditional approach of how we rank, r do a cyber range, right? So we all use Visio and PowerPoint. How many people use Visio and PowerPoint to draw out an infrastructure of some sort? Come on, raise your hands. You all done it. Everybody's done it. I hate it, right? And then somebody says, well, how does that work? And oh, i got to print that out. So that, that takes hours, right? That can be that. What if you had something that was like a live Visio diagram? You could drag and drop and do it. You could do it in minutes, right? And it could be self-service. How many people have had to request a new VM or a new infrastructure or something? And I know it says hours there. And the familiar says days and months. But I've seen it be a lot longer than that. If you go to Mill Cloud at DISA and you ask for a new VM of something they don't have, it's 90 days <laughs> till they get it to you, right? It could be wrong, right? What's the worst case? Anybody had something like take more than a couple months? No? Sometimes it does, right? It's just what it takes, right? What if you can just do it yourself, drag, drop, pop it in, and you got it, and you can consume it, right? That's a big deal. Um, you know, how many people love CLIs here? Put your hands down. No one loves a CLI. Come on, come on, guys. Uh, that's how people do it, right? That's how you do it. You type away, type away, type away. Um, we have an interesting story. I, I, I do another blog and a little pitch on, uh, uh, do you ever wonder how many miles your mouse travels in a day? Anybody? You ever sit down? You guys are Google guys now. But if let's say you went to AW, how many people have used AWS before? Couple of you? All right, good, good. All right. So if you sit down in AWS and you spin up a few VMs and a few VLANs, how far do you think your mouse travels in that process? No, it's not that bad. But it is a quarter mile. <laughs> we verified it. We actually put together some software, had a bunch of engineers try it, go through the whole process, putting the S3 buckets in, taking care of the policies and compliance and putting the VLANs and the security groups and all that crap. And oh yeah, I had to be a pretty well versed AWS guy to pull that off. You can implement it in a cyber range and automate a lot of those features, and it only takes you 30 yards, not a quarter mile. So, and half the button clicks, half the clicks, and half the smarts required of the person to consume and do that. So the training can be much less. So that complex versus simple access to do those kinds of things is a big deal in 
automating the efficiency and production, uh, productivity of people. And then being able to be multi-tenant and scalable and global and shared and support Active Directory and LDAP and secure LDAP and SSO and SAML 2.0 and TLS and all those other darn buzzwords that we have uh, and managing that from a lifecycle management and multi-domain, multi-tenant perspective is not trivial, but having the right kinds of tools that can help you with that is a big deal as well. Okay. I have some examples. It's always fun. See some real world. Uh, this is done in a tool called Cloud Shell um, as an example. So on the left, you have an embedded LMS, so you can actually have instructions. How many people here have been a, a higher end admin person? You're having to bring along a new startup person or somebody that's uh, a junior level engineer. And the first thing they do is they start sending you emails like crazy and calling you on the phone like, how do I do this? How do I do that? How do I do this? And you're like, oh, man, I just wish I had something that I could reference them, an application note or something. You have to go hunt that down or you have to build it. But what if you could send the infrastructure to them with how to use it built into it so they don't give you any calls, right? And then also maybe I want to have some automation in there for a training range or cyber range exercise, and I want to have some scripts and things that they can run that's easy to do and it's parameterized. You can build that kind of stuff in as well. Here's an example. This is uh, Cyber Shield 2017 from the National Guard. A little more complex environment, kind of hard to see. Down at the bottom, though, is uh, a Cisco switch and some HMIs and PLCs. HMIs, Human Machine Interface, and PLCs, Programmable Logic Controller. Uh, so these are SCADA devices, right? ICS, control systems, stuff like that. So, and then over on the right, I got a bunch of PCs, which are a bunch of blue team people defending this network. Above that, I've got another Cisco switch, which has a bunch of servers, which are kind of the things getting attacked. Over on the left-hand side, I've got a bunch of uh, other VMs, which are red team people on the left-hand side. I guess I should point at it. And then I've got a, a traffic generator at the top, generating a lot of traffic coming through a gateway router to a firewall, going into a router to populate that out. And then you can run a cyber exercise. You've got red team people, blue team. You can practice purple if you want to, right? Whatever. What's nice, though, is I have multiple views of that same cyber range, right? So the SCADA engineer doesn't get to see the whole big picture. The SCADA engineer just gets to see their HMIs and PLCs, right? And control those environments, right? So they see a subset of that. And that's all they, they have in the view of that particular cyber exercise. Uh, we might be doing cyber training or a training environment, right? So uh, maybe we have a, a trainer that's doing a cyber training class. Um, so we have, uh, in this case, we're training some cybersecurity on an MX480 Juniper router. Uh, notice it has little dotted lines around it. So in Iraq, in this training system, we had a whole bunch of 480 routers, right? And we don't care which one the student gets, they get one. So we call that an abstract topology. So at execution time, the dotted lines go away and it fills in an IP address of the router it picked. And it spins up another blueprint sandbox with a student Linux and a student Windows for each one of the students. And it creates a new sandbox for them that they can then do their exercise and their training, whatever it is they're doing. Um, we might have course content. Right on the side, so we have LMS, we have multiple infrastructures and resources and connections of them that you can do for there. Um, we might have something called over the shoulder email driven training. So we might have a cyber instructor that says, hey, I have this class, I wanna send this to these students. These students know nothing about the particular tool. I made it make it completely idiot proof for them. So I just give them a link, okay, sends it to them in an email. They click on the email, it opens up a browser and in the browser, it opens the VM that they have to do the work in, and all the instructions are on the side. There's no tools, there's no nothing, it's just, there's my VM, follow the directions, right? However, the instructor might want to go back and fix something. Maybe the student calls them up and says, hey, I, I don't get this. So the instructor can actually jump on the student's box so they both see each other and what they're doing, so I can go in and correct them, I can watch what the student's doing and see that at the same time. So as a cyber trainer, that's a really useful tool to do that. How many people here work in a SOC or have worked in a SOC? Anybody? More power to you guys, right? How many tools do you have to learn? Too many. <laughs> 30, 40, how many? Just, just a ton, right? Are you an expert on all 30? <laughs> no, no. Nobody can be, right? You can't be, right? 
So now we have tier one, we have tier two, tier three, SOC engineers, right? So this was an example from AT&T, uh, federal group for the Department of Justice. And if you notice, these are smaller icons because you can represent them a little differently in this tool, but there's a ton of different tools in here. And there's no way a tier one guy is going to be an expert on all those different tools, how to use them, run through them, whatever. If they get a ticket, comes in, hey, this DOJ router went down, my email went down, fix it, right? So he says, okay, he jumps in, he jumps into his tools, it's like, all right, what am I going to do? Well, what if you had automation behind those tools that did maybe 90 or 95% of the typical things that you did with that tool and automate it and made it easier to use for that SOC engineer. For example, how many commands are there in Cisco IOS? Anybody? You guys don't know how many? Thousands, right? How many do you use on a daily basis? Anybody? Anybody through Cisco? How about Juniper? How many, how many commands do you use in a router? Well, I get various things, five? I've heard five, I've heard 10. I had somebody told me 50 and I said, uh, BS, right? That's not true. It's, you don't use 50, you might use 15. But you want to understand for that particular tool or whatever it is, in this case, that's a Nexus uh, Cisco switch, which is a pretty complicated device. It's got a lot of power and capability. But I bring out onto the right-hand side the typical commands that I use for that device or that service or that tool so that now I don't have to go down deep into that. I don't hope to open up the CLI, type the login, the password, go into config T mode, do all that stuff to do whatever that is that I'm trying to do. I can now just click on the right-hand side and say create VLAN, boom, done. And I don't have to do anything else, right? So you raise the level of abstraction from an automation perspective of the task and the things that you do in your cyber range, right? Whether it's a SOC, training, whatever, to make it easier and more efficient for the people that are doing the task in that environment. Anybody know what a flyaway kit is? Heard of a flyaway kit? Any military people here? Yeah. Flyaway kits are basically gear we put in a box and we fly away with it and it does some sort of function when we get there, right? So the DHS has these flyaway kits from a group called HERT, the Hunt Incident Response Team. And we were working with them on building a, basically a 2E rack server, put VMware on it, and then we install all these tools in the topologies inside, which are all their hunt tools, all their incident response tools. So I've got, you know, Akamai, I've got CloudStrike, I've got X-Force, I've got, you know, other kinds of things, Splunk, whatever. I've got Bro and Kali Linux and, you know, all these weird cybersecurity tools that they like to use. So they're all in this environment ready to go. I've got help there in case they forget how to use some of them. And then down at the bottom, there's a Vios router that I connect up to a switch. So when Bank of America calls them or whoever, JP Morgan says, we've been hacked, help DHS. They take six cyber engineers, stick them on a plane, give them this rack with the flyaway kit, fly them to wherever it is, hook it up to the network. And now they've got all their tools installed, automated, ready to go to do whatever things they got to do. Now they might do it all remotely too, right? You know, if they're allowed to do that, but it just depends on what you are. But that's a use case. Um, CICD, is anybody doing development of cyber tools here? Anybody building new cyber tools, building new cyber apps, DevSecOps? No? All right, we'll, we'll run through this one quickly. You can also automate your DevOps flows and, and CICD flows. Um, one of the things also very important with cyber ranges is sometimes people have limited amounts of space and compute power in their cyber range and they need to be able to deploy to different places. So up here at the top, it may be hard to see, but you'll see it says vCenter, and it says AWS, and it says Azure. Those are multiple deployment paths, so I can take that Vios router that I have in my cyber range and deploy it at different times whenever I run this sandbox, this cyber range, and I can deploy it to different clouds whenever I use it and pick the cloud I want to deploy it in, or VMware, for example. And then I can also config, uh, configure things, right? So down at the bottom, I've got a domain controller, secondary domain controller, exchange server, web server, all tied in on that loop over there, hard to see. But I have configuration management sort. So I'm running an Ansible server, so I pass the parameters in from that resource box that then configures that particular domain controller to my IP addresses, my domains, my user information, et cetera, right? So you can do full configuration management and manage that from an automation perspective. So when you spin your cyber range up, it really is your production cyber range, right? 
Um, we also do full bare metal stacks. That's a HCI, uh, UCS environment. I won't cover that really well. But you can basically do full cyber range of service where you, we actually also build an LMS that you can add an LMS to it. You can do labs, get assessment stores, we have uh, hundreds of labs that you can bring into these kinds of things and build out and rebrand this to your own environment. Uh, so you have your own internal cyber ranges as, uh, uh, as a service deployment. I think, oh, what to do next? Perform an audit of your needs. Go talk to the people. Is anybody interested in a cyber range? If they're not, eh, not much else to do. If they say, yeah, we could use some training or yeah, I don't know how our guys run our production network. We need some training for those guys. We need help with those guys. Perform an audit of your needs, right? Training range, exercise, training content, et cetera. What do you need? Are you on-prem, you off-prem, right? Are you physical, virtual, or some sort of hybrid environment? Who are the end users? Query their needs, right? Identify future needs and engage with companies that provide cyber ranges, do a scale of those, check them out, see, see which ones meet your needs because there are different ones, lots of different ones out there. And then check with other entities using cyber ranges for best practices as well. That's it for my presentation. I'll take any questions if you have, but uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we have some websites if you want to go read some blogs and uh, find out more about our stuff. And we also offer a free cyber range audit to help you with that what next thing if you're interested in that. Any questions? I did a good job then? Is that, is that what that means? I didn't get any questions. So anyway, you're welcome to come by our kiosk as well if you want to dive into this and see some actual stuff. We have some live demos and stuff to, uh, probably tomorrow. I think this is the last session, so it'll be tomorrow morning if you want to come by. And we'd be more than happy to talk to you about your specific application and problems or issues. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much.